Hello, and welcome to CPH Session 18, Descriptive Statistics, Summarizing and Visualizing Data. This is Part A, an introduction to descriptive statistics. This session focuses on an area of statistics known as descriptive statistics. The study of statistics can be broken into two main branches, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics summarize data usually into a single value, such as the average or standard deviation of the data. The other thing we can use descriptive statistics to do is to visualize the data we've collected. We can use histograms, scatter plots, or pie charts to name a few. Descriptive statistics do not draw any conclusions, such as a significant difference between two groups. That type of analysis falls within inferential statistics, and we will cover that in session 19. In session 18, part A, I will show you an example of descriptive statistics in action. Through that, we will learn what the difference is between a population and a sample. We will define what a representative sample is. And I will demonstrate to you what the difference is between how we use descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. I'll begin with an example from the 2016 presidential primary race. You may remember that in the spring of 2016, the Republican primary race had five main contenders still in the race. Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, John Kasich, and Ben Carson. During the primary election in Virginia, 1,024,013 Republican voters cast votes for a candidate. Those 1,024,013 votes represent every single vote that was cast in that election. Therefore, because it represents every person included within our target group, Republicans in Virginia that voted in spring 2016, we call that the population. This graph shows the results. As you can see, about 35% of the population cast votes for Donald Trump, about 32% for Marco Rubio, and so on. Let's say we want to know more, though. Let's say we want to know something about the demographics of the population, such as their age, sex, education level, marital status, and so on. Well, we could ask every single person in the population, all one million plus. That would be impossible, or at least very expensive, or time-consuming. So what do we do? Instead, we take a sample of the population. A sample is a subset of the population. If it is done without bias and randomly, we can usually create a sample that has the same demographic makeup as the population. If our sample has the same demographics as the population, we can consider it a representative sample. For example, if our population, all the Virginia Republican voters who cast ballots in the spring 2016 primary, has a demographic cross-section that is 56% male and average age of 43 years, and our sample also has around 56% male and around an average age of 43 years, then our sample is representative of the population. Sampling strategies is an important component of research design for quantitative studies. Sampling must be designed carefully to achieve the outcome we're looking for. An improper sampling strategy could introduce significant bias or error into our study. We will talk more about this later in the program. Let's go back to Virginia. Remember, we wanted to know something about the demographics of our population. Let's say we want to know about the education level of our population. So, we take a sample. In politics, this sample of the voting population is achieved through an exit poll. They randomly sample voters as they leave the voting station and ask them questions. Our sample size is 1,523 voters, or about 0.15% of the population. When we take this sample, we find that around 29% of our sample had some level of postgraduate study, a little more than 30% had a graduated college, and around 12% had a high school diploma or less. 
Again, if we sampled without significant bias, we can assume that these results are representative of the entire population. But 0.15% of the population is a pretty small number. Even with a well-designed sampling strategy, we could still get an unrepresentative sample from what's known as sampling error. In other words, we just by chance maybe got more educated people into our study, or by chance got more less educated people into our study. Therefore, we have to acknowledge that there is some margin of error to our results. In other words, given our sample size and the results that we got, we can assume that the actual proportion of college-educated people lies within this range with a very high likelihood. So, because we knew the entire population's voting results, and secondly, we took a sample and knew their education level, the next question we might ask is given someone's education level, who do they vote for? And are there any differences in voter preference between education level? Well, in our sample exit poll, we asked voters who they voted for and their education level. So we have a cross-sectional study that can compare voter preference among education levels. This graph visualizes the results. Based on the results, we can see that if someone had a high school degree or less, about 50% of those voters voted for Donald Trump, while 20% of that group voted for Rubio. On the other hand, the highly educated group disproportionately voted for Rubio and not for Trump. Descriptive statistics only takes us this far, though. If we want to know if the difference is real, that is, is there likely to be an actual difference in the population's voting preference as a whole based on their education level? To do that, we need inferential statistics. So we will come back to this in session 19. That's it for part A. In part B, we will re review the kinds of data we can come across in statistics.